Welcome to the Harper's Magazine podcast. I'm Christopher Bea, the editor of Harper's Magazine. In this week's episode, I speak with Joyce Carol Oates, whose short story, The Return, appears in the latest issue of the magazine. She is also the author of quite literally more than 100 books of fiction and nonfiction, and perhaps most distinguished in the form of the short story. We are thrilled to have her story in this issue, and I was thrilled to speak with her. I'm very happy to be speaking with Joyce Carol Oates, um, who, among many other things, is the author of a story in our latest issue called The Return. And I want to talk about that and a few other things, but I'm going to start somewhere else. Joyce, you and I first met more than 25 years ago in a classroom at 185 Nassau Street in Princeton. Um, yes. And you had already been, you know, we're well into a distinguished teaching career, and you still teach now, am I right? Yes, I'm returning to Princeton in the fall, actually. And I, as a, I was very excited as a as a freshman, and 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 understood the great privilege it was to um, study with such a a wonderful writer. But I don't think I appreciated then until I took a number of other workshops with a lot of other writers, um, how dedicated you were to teaching and how much time you put in and thought you put into it. Um, teaching creative writing in a workshop is one of those jobs where if you want to cut corners a little bit, you could probably get away with it. Students hand in their work. You can kind of give it a look. You can speak off the cuff from your own experiences. But your approach was really quite thought out, and there was a syllabus, and we had a lot of readings, and we even worked off of an anthology that you had yourself put together. And you continue to do this certainly well past any material need to do it. And I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about the role that teaching plays in your life and why you have kept at it. Well, it's a good question. When I began um, my, my, my conscious life, really, when I was very young, I had wanted to be a teacher. I think that was the first clear idea of a possibility of how to how to guide my life because I admired my teachers so much. So, you know, our primates want to imitate and mimic. So I think that's one of our earliest reflexes, really. I always wanted to be a teacher. Then the idea of being a writer in a way, never occurred to me because I do write and I've always written, but I never said to myself, I want to be a writer in the way that I thought clearly and consciously that I would be a teacher. So I think the first time I ever stepped into a classroom, I was very young. I was about 21 at the University of Detroit. I was teaching a night class. I had a composition. I think I had about 35 students, which is very large. And I just remember feeling so excited and so thrilled and I looked out at the students and I really felt that I in a way I sort of knew them or identified with them I really liked them and I looked forward to getting their compositions some of those students were actually older than I was quite a bit because it was night school I even had a Detroit police officer he didn't bring his gun to the class but he was there and I just felt it was like stepping into another world so I think that probably I have never lost that feeling of opening a door, stepping into that world of other people, and consequently, teaching creative writing, I get to know the students much better. And there are fewer students. There are sometimes as few as 10 students in a workshop. So it's always been a very positive experience for me. People do ask me about it as if it seems a little curious to them. And I suppose maybe it is, but to me it was always very natural. Did you, I know you went to graduate school for literature, but did you ever take a writing workshop as a student? I took writing workshops as an undergraduate at Syracuse, but not at, at Madison where I got my master's degree. I don't think there were any, or I didn't take any. But I don't have a degree in writing. It's I don't have an MFA. But was um, 
Was the classroom setting important for your development as a writer, or did that more come from the that kind of private urge to write? Well, I was writing before I took any writing workshop. However, I did have a very stimulating and encouraging professor at Syracuse. I don't really remember the workshop situation so much, getting criticism or advice from the other writers. That's kind of all faded. But I do remember that this instructor, a professor, was very encouraging. And so probably that was, that was excellent for me. Somebody who thought that I was very promising and who maybe suggested texts for me to read. I mean, it might have gone otherwise. I think, especially in the past, many women writers and women poets were ac actively discouraged from writing or from the subject matter they wanted to write about by male professors. I actually have some friends who had that experience. But with me, it was really just the opposite. I was uh, I may have been a little bit insecure or uncertain about what I was doing, but this professor was very encouraging. You also, you, you mentioned your, your graduate degree was, was in literature. One of the things that I remember from your class was that in many writing workshops, you do just workshop your own work, but you gave us work to read. And one of the things that I felt you were trying to impress on us was a sense that being a reader was a very important component of being a writer. And, and reading oh. like a, a, a writer was important as opposed to maybe reading the way that you are going to be reading in a literature seminar. Oh, absolutely. It's such a pleasure to read with other people. And I probably teach some of the same texts I may have taught when you were in the class. I don't remember. I always do an early story by Ernest Hemingway, for instance. The craftsmanship is just so like a jewel. It's just so beautifully written. And it's really a real pleasure in it. So I always feel, always really feel very positive about going back to school. I remember when I was a little girl, literally little, I would be so excited as September approached because I would be going back to school. And I still have some of the same feelings, which I suppose is curious or odd, but yet that's just my personality. I want to switch gears slightly, but this is actually coming also out of my experience in the classroom with you. I remember a long time ago you wrote a story called JCO and I, which was um, working off of the uh, Borges' famous story, Borges and I. Yes. And I, I believe yes. you had us read both of them, but 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 both stories are, are about the way that um, the separation in some ways between the the writer in the room, the closed room, and then the public figure and um, these questions of identity. And um, and I, like many people, I recently read an interview that you gave to the New York Times. I can say uh, uh, probably five or six people who knew that you and I have a, a longstanding relationship sent this to me. Um, it was a fascinating interview that a lot of people were talking about. And um, I'm a little um, wary interviewing you now since you spoke so eloquently in that about being an interview subject. But you, you talked about the way that you get into an interview and you get asked questions and you feel like you have to give answers and you sometimes just say what comes into your head and then that becomes part of the corpus of, you know, what Joyce Carol Oates believes about writing or about this and that. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your attitude towards um, your public reputation or, or, or this other person that is uh, Joyce Carol Oates, the, the public figure. Oh, Chris, I don't really think I have any, re any relationship at all. It just doesn't interest me very much. But I'm sort of thinking about what you said about a minute ago. Are you sure that I assigned something by me? Because there's a. It's possible that you that you assigned the Borges story, and then I went and fa and you mentioned that you had done something on it, and and I went and found it. The reason I'm mentioning it is in the same anthology. There's Updike and and me, and so I often assign the Borges and and me or I, and Updike. 
So maybe then I assign those two because I don't assign anything of my own writing. I mean, they actually, that must it makes me it. cringe with cringe with embarrassment at the thought of even thinking <laughs> of doing that. I, I never do that. But the, but the Updike and I is he wrote John wrote that in response to Borges and I, and the two of them are excellent together. And I actually identify pretty much with what John Updike says. So it's not that much of a stretch. John felt that, he, like me, he came from a kind of a rural background, not very prosperous rural background. And he felt that John Updike became the person that he created out of the, the kind of details. I'm forgetting the actual nouns that he used, but it's almost like flotsam and jetsam of his childhood that he he put together this puppet-like dummy or something that becomes updike out of the shards and fragments of his life then that becomes the creature called updike that goes out into the world that accrues all the attention but he himself is sort of in the background. I really understood what John meant by that because it's probably the same with all writers. You concoct some sort of creative being out of what you have experienced. Hemingway speaks of this too. All that you have known, all that you have seen, you put together. And then this force, whatever it is, creates some stories or creates some books. And people look upon it as if it were an entity, as if you are the entity, but you're actually not. So it's hard. It's perhaps, It may be harder to explain it than it is just to feel it. Right. I think we all feel that way. Well, that leads me actually into um, a, a, a question along those lines that re relates to this story, The Return, um, and to the general question of how you bring your own life to bear on the page in your fiction. Um, you know, there's this story concerns, you know, two characters, one visiting another character, and the, the other character has recently been widowed for the second time. That's an experience that you have written about in your own life. But it's obviously not a piece of quote unquote auto fiction. You know, it's not from the perspective of the widow and also what winds up happening, which has a real sort of um, charged kind of magical power to it um, is, is clearly invented. Um, but at the same time, there seems there's there's something about it, and then you know the the drive takes place in this area in uh, in New Jersey, and there's there's pieces of it that 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 do seem to begin out of life, and then there is all of the magical transformation that is um, writing fiction, and we're in a moment right now with the rise of auto fiction where a lot of people don't seem as interested in the part of it that is the kind of magical transformation of life into this literature on the page. But you still seem very committed to that piece of the process. Well, it's hard to answer that. I, I think that there are a lot of readers in the world, and many people are deeply into what we call speculative fiction, a kind of really poetic science fiction. You know, not everybody is reading autofiction. There are, there are many readers who are reading other things. I mean, just in terms of million, millions of readers, they're probably reading something like uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. You know, it's probably something that we, or a romance novel, or Harry Potter or something, which is, which is magical or fantastic. And so it may be a very narrow ribbon or band of people who... I think you're right about that. I think even among people who read literary fiction that's not what most of them read but it is what right. people within maybe the critical community or academic community or something like that it, it, are it's interested really in. hard to say about those people too i mean there's a lot of interest in speculative fiction i think it lends itself to our time of ai generated work and 
the uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in almost can't be dealt with in, in realistic fiction. And maybe auto fiction is a retreat to the self because the overwhelming uh, mystery or almost the devastating mystery of the world is too much for writer, most writers to deal with today. I mean, we have this imminent climate change disaster, which is beginning to strike parts of the world. It's no longer a theory or some speculation. And then we have people who are steadfastly not believing in science and they're sort of all in the same time zone. You know, like there are people who are living in our country right now whose mentality is almost medieval. They're believing in something against their own interests and also against their own the evidence of their senses and so forth. But then we have a really cutting edge, extremely sophisticated kind of technology. And, and this is all sort of simultaneous. So for some people to retreat just to their own lives and write about that, about their, you know, a divorce or something in their own life, that may be a way of just dealing with the fact of wanting to write, but not being able to even look up, you know, look out the window. Mm -hmm. But a few minutes ago, you, you sort of harkened back to the workshop. And I think one of the exciting features of teaching for me is that it's very ahistoric. That when I step into a writing workshop, though it may be 2023, at the same time, it's also no time. It could be 1983. The students in their writing selves and their interest in writing and, and language almost are ahistoric too. I wouldn't say that you're interchangeable because of course there's, there is history, but there's something, it's probably the same with students who are really good musicians or students who are artists or students who are dancers that people who teach them are teaching a kind of essence, a kind of talent or young talent and so when I go into the workshop, I don't necessarily live in the time in which I'm living and outside the workshop. So obviously my life has moved on historically and all sorts of things have happened to me. Yet when I'm a writer, it can almost be that it's no time at all. I could write a story set, I could write a story set in 1961 as plausibly as I could write something in 1991 or 2021. I mean, that's just the way the mind is. And I notice a lot of a lot of writers today are, write, are setting stories and fiction novels in the past before the internet or before cell phones, because somehow life seemed easier to navigate then. So this story obviously belongs to a time in my life when I'm much older and have had this experience of losing two husbands and I'm haunted by things that when I was a young writer, I, d I hadn't experienced yet. To return to this question of the kind of alchemical process by which life gets turned into art, you write in a lot of different genres, I'd say, not just story and novel and essay, but you write a lot of fiction that I think could be classified as realism and then speculative fiction and, and sort of gothic fiction and um, uh, some things that kind of straddle the line. And I'm wondering, when you start writing a story like this that begins with a, a very sort of realist premise and then gradually moves into other territory, whether you have a plan going in that that's what you're going to do, whether you set certain rules for yourself about what can or cannot happen in a story as you're moving along or whether that all just gets dictated by the process or by something kind of intuitive. Well, I think it depends upon what the work is. Obviously, with a novel, we're moving so much through time as well as space, that 
many things have to be changed. But with a short story, if it, if it usually has a kind of climactic moment, and then, then a sort of conclusion. And sometimes if you structure it in a way, the final sentence is also a kind of climax. I mean, they're just sort of structural ways of doing it. But I think what happens is that we can, many of us do write memoirs and we do write memoirist fiction. I have, I have written some stories that are you know, much more about myself than they are about um, fictitious situations. But with a story like this, I don't, I don't know whether I should say that's the problem with autofiction or memoirist fiction or realism. The problem is that you can't express extreme situations that are kind of mysterious. I mean, I'm not being very articulate. It's, it's a subject that's actually very elusive. Say, say if you suffered a great loss, if, some, if the closest person in your life died, you would then be, be quite haunted by that person. Uh, not just the idea or even the memory, but somehow a kind of visceral sensation, sometimes an emotion like agitation or great sorrow, or, or sudden elation, or even a sense of horror. I mean, a kind of terror. There are a lot of emotions that follow having lost someone that are somehow not describable in realistic fiction. And mm -hmm. in other words, if you're writing auto fiction and you're writing about how you're missing your, you're missing your, your father, your mother, or say a child died, heaven, heaven forbid, you could sort of write about it, but you wouldn't be really evoking it to the reader. So that's, that's why there are stories about ghosts and apparitions that are perceived as if they are real by someone in the story, if not necessarily by the writer, because the hauntedness, which we experience in dreams also, we don't necessarily know whether the people we dream about are alive or dead. They could be dead people, but we perceive them in dreams as if they're alive. So I think if you if you want to um, communicate that emotion, which is quite raw and unnameable, you sort of have to go into a genre that's not realism, that may be surreal. So I think that's, Whenever I write about a subject like this, and I've written about it a bit, I always find myself easing, easing into a kind of dream world or a surreal world because the lost person is still real to the deeper self. I don't know about your own personal experience, but you probably have had some dreams in which a person not living appears. Could be a grandmother or a sure. parent. Yeah, and in that dream, the person is alive, may not speak, or may speak. It, I guess it just depends. But the emotional equivalent is that the person is alive. So how how would you do that in auto fiction? It would be almost impossible to have the same effect. It's why some writers like. Mar Gabriel Marquez move into what we what we call magical realism. I guess he felt that the hallucinatory effect of life in his world could only be served by magical realism. Strict realism would not really communicate it. Sorry for such a long answer because it's something that I've, I've tried to think about. Yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating topic. Um, the there. Your career has overlapped with a lot of, broadly speaking, postmodernist writers, many of whom were, you know, I think you were pretty friendly with, who were very adamant that they were not trying in fiction to sort of capture reality in some way. But if I understand you, what, what you're saying is that even when your work departs from strict reality, there's some emotional truth or sort of deeper core of truth 
that you are trying to get at, that this idea that your, your work is expressing something about life um, rather than being a kind of autonomous piece of art in the way that some of the postmodernists uh, wanted it to be, that, that's, that that stays with you. Well, I think that we, we have different motives for, for writing, and I'm not sure that the, I don't know which postmodernist you mean, but uh, even, Neville, even Nebukov, who is such a sort of self-conscious uh, postmodernist, th- there's always that core of the, the lone beating heart, you know, deep inside and in pale fire, for instance. You, you find some little pulse of emotion like a little butterfly with its wings beating, that's the reason that he wrote it, you know. And then all constructed around that, uh, Joyce's Ulysses is like that too. It's sort of the artistic way of hiding, hiding behind a great carapace that's ornate and beautiful and uh, and original and you know striking. Um, you know, I think Joyce said that he wrote Ulysses to preserve the speech of his father and his father's friends. And I'm sure that's it. You know, he wanted to preserve that beating pulse of memory when he was a boy. That's Dublin. Maybe he was like 18, 17 or 18 years old. But um, that's why he wrote Ulysses. I mean, there are, there are other motives too, but he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have written it perhaps without that emotional connection. Yeah. I'm thinking about, I don't know how many people still take notice of, of, of this bit of literary history, but I'm thinking about some of the fights between John Gardner and uh, William Gass, for example, about this idea that, that uh, b- b- basically about, about whether art can or should deliver truths about the world or about life or whether it should just sort of be its own thing. Well, I, it, I don't think it was a very sensible de- argument because Bill Gass had emotion in his work. He had plenty of, e- plenty of emotion in his work. He just was a different person. I knew John Gardner quite well. John was um, a kind of overbearing person. Like if you, were, if you were at a dinner party with John, he would dominate. You know, He sort of had to have dominance in many ways and I liked him very much but he sort of got on a hobby horse about moral fiction because it was the one thing that wasn't being done by other people he was he was a magical realist himself he was an experimental writer but I think he looked around and he saw what Bartholomew was doing and John Barth particularly even more than Bill Bill Gass he just sort of saw that he he had to stake out his claim. You know, if you're a young artist, you can't do what your elders are doing. Andy Warhol did exactly the same thing. He looked around and saw this fantastic abstract expressionist of the, you know, an older generation. He couldn't do that. I mean, it's been done. And it was overwhelming, so Warhol turned in a completely different direction, and this is what people who are brilliant or geniuses often do. I mean, de Kooning and Pollock did the same thing. You sort of look around and see what the other talent in the room is doing, and you, you realize you can't do that. So some of that was what the motives for, for John Gardner. But everybody does what they want to do. I mean, there's plenty of emotion in Donald Barthamy. You just have to look for it. It's sort of hidden. Do you know his his uh, short story? I think it's called The School. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, I teach that sometimes. That's a beautiful, beautiful mel- meditation on death and love. And, you know, that's very, very beautiful, I think. I think, too, of something like Georges Perec's novel, um, that is in English is called Avoid, the one that famously doesn't have an E, and often brought up like, the Ulipo as that kind of like abstract cerebral fiction that's just trying to solve some kind of formal problem and not engaged with life. But then if you know a little bit about Perec's, uh life, he's actually 
you know, he lost his parents in in the Holocaust, and 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 is actually writing around that in this thing, and and so this this thing that gets treated as the ultimate kind of cold cerebral mm. project actually has this incredible emotional core to it, and that's the absence that he's writing about. No, I didn't. I'd, I've heard about the Nava, but I, I haven't read it. Yes, that is very interesting. Well, you know, it ha we have to have a motive for doing something. <laughs> you know, that people have to enjoy what they're doing. And I think there's a great reward in being playful and people construct enormously complicated plots, mystery detective writers. Like they really enjoy these complicated plots. You know, and now I'm going to do this, but then I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to surprise the reader by doing this. You know, it's a different kind of sensibility from many of us who are literary writers, but they enjoy doing that. Do you, to, to ask a, a sort of crude question, do, do you get a lot of enjoyment out of being at the desk every day, out of the writing itself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, I, I work on dramatic units one at one at a time if i'm writing a novel it sort of stretches out almost to the horizon but each each dramatic unit advances the, the story in, in some way so the dramatic units are really um they're like little plays i may not have that much dialogue or i may have dialogue but it could be 10 pages long it could be three pages long you know, it's like a dramatic unit. I work on one at a time. So they're like one-act plays. And that's always very challenging and exciting. And Not are I, you I, aware of how they're going to fit into the larger structure? Oh, yeah, yeah. I would have the whole novel like in my computer. Like I have the ending. I have most of the chapters, at least notes or outlines or something. So I just go through it, like the beginning at the, the beginning of the file is the beginning of the novel, and then I'm, I'm working on something on, on page 290 at the moment. But in the file, there's probably like 400 pages. So I'm sort of making my way slowly along a terrain. I would guess many people write that way today because of computers. You put your whole outline right in the computer, and then you just tr you trudge or burrow yeah. or crawl through it each day. Is that how you write? I, I still write. I write in longhand and notebook. Well, I I do that too. I have a whole yeah. lot of longhand, yeah. Um, but yeah. and then I find that the the process of you know I don't have the Jamesian amanuensis or the the Mad Men era typist. Um, I then have to sit and type up all of my longhand writing, and that process is is it has now been built in as part of the process for me. It's one of the stages yes. at which revision yeah. happens. I do have a lot of notes here, and then I put them on, on the computer. I think any way that people write is usually, it's usually pleasurable, and so it's exciting. Sometimes one is surprised. Some, I try to cut. I mean, sometimes I ac actually have to expand something because it's too short. But, um, but as I was saying, a short story is generally has a structure that's moving with great acceleration. It just sort of keeps gaining momentum and then it comes to a certain point and then it may have a conclusion. But there's some writers like uh, Edgar Karat, the Israeli writer, who almost don't have any conclusions. The stories are very short. They're sort of like bullets or arrows flying mm -hmm. and then, then they end, you know, or maybe two or three pages long. Your stories, and this definitely... Um goes for this story, the return that's 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 in the magazine this month, um, are are so good at creating a mood and a sort of atmosphere. Um, very often, or you know, certainly one of them is a is a atmosphere of kind of menace. Um, and I I I wonder to what extent you are going through that emotionally when you're writing, or whether you're able to separate yourself from the mood and think about the the strategies that you as the artist are engaging in in order to create that mood in the reader? Well, the return is sort of a special story because it has a lot of elements from my own life that are in the story. And so 
it was an experiment of a kind where I'm attributing the um, experiences to a fictitious person who's not me, but in some respects shares some of my life. So it's set in this place. And my husband, Charlie Gross, was a neuroscientist. And he did go out every morning of his life to get the newspaper, the New York Times. And we have a long driveway. And he would walk back along the driveway and he'd be reading the paper. And we were kind of walking kind of slowly. He was from Flatbush in Brooklyn. And he just loved the New York Times. It was part of his whole life. And um, so that the woman who's she's haunted by, she looks up and she sees again, she knows he's not really there, but she sort of sees her husband coming along the drive, the long driveway. And she's trapped in that psychological state or in that mood or maybe it's just mourning, uh, grief. She's trapped in the house. She's trapped at the table. She's trapped staring out the window at this phenomenon. And she's reliving it again and again and again. Now the woman who comes to visit her leaves. She sort of runs away. And she even parked out by the road so she could make a fast getaway. So I mean, if somebody wanted to analyze the story, it probably has to do with my grief or my mourning for, for my husband, but also the feeling that maybe it is um, it's, it's a psychopathological kind of situation that it's not productive or it's not a good idea, and that if the person did come back and you were back in your marriage, it's just like ordinary life, you know. You would start having an argument, the person... Mm-hmm forgets he died you know he's he's back now and he's he's irritated about the lawn or he he's he's de- complaining about his his sons or something so it's like you you step from that magical world where you want somebody to come back from the dead or yourself coming back from the dead but then after an hour or so back in the world again you're just annoyed by the same things that bothered you when you were alive so all all that's kind of in the story, and I meant it to be maybe a little blackly humorous too. But many people, if anybody reads it who knew Charlie, they would say, "Oh my God, that's Charlie!" <laughs> Charlie, and I have to say that it gave me great pleasure to bring him back to life because he's sort of really he's really on the page, and when I read it, it's it's sort of really him. Now all yeah. this wouldn't make any sense to anybody who didn't know him. And if anybody did, did know him and read the story, I I literally don't know how they would react to it. I, I mean, it's just sort of a blank. I, I don't really know how they would or, or will react to it. But it's a all, remarkable all, all thing listen, to be able All to this do. in the story, I'm Chris, you know, all this in the story, like maybe every page of Harper's is just, if you unpack every page of this personal story behind it and all this anguish and so forth. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the remarkable thing is to be able to to write um, something that has that kind of meaning for you and for the people who knew your late husband, but then for just a reader picking up a magazine is um, uh, so powerful in a completely different way. I think we have taken up enough of your time. So uh, on that note, I will say I encourage everyone to read the story, which is really fantastic and irreducible to any of the things that we're talking about, although it's been fascinating to talk with you about it. Well, Chris, could I just say one more thing? This is uh, because the, the, the conversation really is sort of interesting to me. I may haven't talked about this before. I mean, your question kind of brought it out. I was thinking of um, Portrait of an Artist, and Stephen Dedulis is so feels so wrecked with guilt because his mother was dying, and she wanted him to. She wanted in real life. James Joyce's mother wanted him to to kneel by her bed and pray with her, but he wouldn't do it. And so, very much there's a thread through Portrait of an Artist and also in Ulysses. Stephen is haunted by his mother. And there are some lines here and there 
where he sort of sees her and he feels so guilty that he didn't he didn't kneel he didn't pray but if he had to do it again he wouldn't do it again i mean he would do the same yeah. thing again and then all this is seen in a kind of jocular way by Buck Mulligan, who says, here's Stephen, whose mother is beastly dead. <laughs> he introduces Stephen to some other person. In other words, Joyce is also making fun of himself. You know, Here's Stephen, whose mother is beastly dead. He feels sorry for his mother and for himself. At the same time, from Buck Mulligan's point of view, there's something ludicrous about it, you know, and like the word his mother is beastly dead. The first thing to say about him, because he's going around with a kind of sorrowful look. And and Joyce obviously is working very much with extremely powerful personal emotions, but he's able to put it out there so that the reader almost experiences it like a, like a, a scene in a movie. You know, you see Stephen, you see Buck Mulligan, you may even see the, the wraith-like apparition of the, the dead mother and so forth. Anyway, that was a footnote to... Yeah. No, it's interesting because what what a certain kind of writer would do, of course, is write the version in which he does kneel at his mother's uh, bedside um, in a kind of a wish fulfillment way. He's well, racked with guilt. Point. He didn't yeah. do it. But, yeah. but that's, yeah. of course, not what Joyce does in part because, as you say, he knows that if he had it all to do over again, he would do the same thing and still be racked with the same guilt. Yes, and if people came back from the dead, they would be the same people they were before. You know, like, <laughs> it's not, it, it wouldn't confer a kind of sainthood. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so it's nice to talk to you. You too. This has been a real pleasure. You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org slash save.